Thank you, Paul. It's beautiful. I totally remember <laughs> Kelly Joe's house being like a showroom. <laughs> so, so well kept and neat. Rachel, do you, what was that all about? He, he definitely liked things tidy and I have inherited that too. Just no clutter anywhere. So, uh, just well, like to have things simple and yep. not, not be overstimulated, I suppose. He succeeded. Yes. Well, thanks for all those videos, everybody. We'll have some more uh, uh, a, a little later on. Um, right now, I'd like to read to you all an email that came in from uh, another musician, Gregory Allen Isakoff, who is also a good friend of Kelly Joe's. And uh, he hoped to make a video but wasn't able to, so he passed along this email that he wanted me to read. So I'm going to read this now from Gregory Allen Isakoff. Kelly Jo Phelps was my friend, my hero, my mentor. We spent many years traveling together and even more years staying in touch. I wanted to share a few snippets that he sent me over the years for the only reason to shed some light on how much he's impacted this world and myself, and I'm sure all of you. How he was a musician that needed to play, not for the spotlight, but for, but for something deeper. How he's been a breath of sanity to me, even when he was in his darkest places maybe even more than. We shared many letters over the years back and forth, and I've included bits of them here, just to let you all know, not like you didn't, that he was such a deep, good, and bright soul, one that I will miss so dearly. So these are, I guess, emails that came in from Kelly Jo, um, starting in, uh, there's a couple here. One of them, this first one is from January 2008. So this is an email from Kelly Jo, to Gregory Allen Isakoff. Hello, my friend. It's very late here out west, heading into four in the morning. My second round looking out of the window. I closed the door back at 8.30 last night, found my pillow easy, easily enough, but now I'm up again. It's colder than typical as well as late. I'm watching Gregory Allen Isakoff videos on YouTube. <laughs> I, I also know that he loved YouTube. It appears you found yourself in Texas for Christmas. Crazy, I miss your company, brother. I've yet to start working musicianing again. I slipped back to New York City last week for a spot on a Bob Dylan tribute, played one song, Hey Mr. Tambourine Man, hung out in the Chelsea Hotel for four more days writing bad poetry, not sleeping, drinking wine, being eaten by bed bugs, listening for the breath of famous people, both dead and not. It was awesome. A couple of days from now, I jumped down to California. That will be the, that will be the official start of 2008. yippee yo. Hello to you. Goodbye to you for now. Thanks for the great music. Thanks for keeping me company the last hour. Love and wishes, dear one. Peace. Kelly Jo. And uh, I also remember Kelly Jo sending me emails about various YouTube things. And actually, I'm going to read you one a little later where he talks about a YouTube thing. Uh, Anyway, this is one more that Gregory Allen Isakoff sent along uh, from Kelly Joe, and this is a note that he sent to Gregory on Thursday, September 10th, 2009. It's called, Why I've Always Loved the Guitar. Sort of a poem. Why I've always loved the guitar and to sing, the canvas of silence, bucket of thinked thoughts. Why I've always wondered why all musicians entirely bent was an honest expression. Why I question the gas in the tank, the cheap food in the sore belly. Why I wonder if I or you have any hope in this adventure. The discovery is so monumental, so religiously sanct. There is magic, bones, thistle, lightning. Painters paint on canvas, musicians paint on silence. There's work yet that can be done. We are the workers. You wield a mighty hammer, friend. So those are messages between Kelly Joe and Gregory Allen Isakoff. Um, Rachel, were you aware of the impact that he had on other musicians as, as you started to get a bit older and were aware of what he was up to as a musician and uh, an influencer of many? It's a good question because he was always very humble. And so he would have never acted or spoke in a way that made it seem like he had such a impact and such a wide reaching impact. But um, I could see that going places with him, going on tour with him, seeing people talk to him after shows or um, speaking with his friends. And it just 
his music is so unique and just like others have been saying in the videos or like he said in, in that uh, email, he just put every bit of himself into his music. He put the deepest parts of himself into his music. And so yeah. um, I think that's why it, it does reach people in the way that it does. Um, but I mean, growing up, he was just my dad and I, I definitely didn't appreciate or really think about how impactful his work was. I understand that. Okay, well, let's drop back into Kelly Joe's solo discography here and look at the next phase of his albums that he made. Those, to me, I've, as I said, grouped them into three kind of phases. Uh, the next phase includes Sky Like a Broken Clock, 2001, Beggar's Oil in 2002, Slingshot Professionals in 03, and the live album Tap the Red Cane Whirlwind in 2005. And this string of albums is when things started to get pretty interesting and Kelly, Kelly was really stretching as a writer and an improviser and he'd left slide guitar behind at this point, which was a total thorn in his side because people kept bugging him to play it at shows all the time, which honestly made him want to play it even less. <laughs> uh, his writing got really deep and experimental through all these records too. So Sky Like a Broken Clock came out in 2001 and that was the first time he wrote all the material on any album. And it was recorded live in the studio with Larry Taylor from Canned Heat on bass, great, great bass player who we lost last year, I think, and Billy Conway on drums. Uh, a lot of the songs on this record stuck in his live repertoire for a long time. I know I played a lot of these songs live with him five or six years after this came out, and that was a long time for him to stay interested in, in a song, honestly. So, uh, you know, it, it, it really means to me that this album was special to him. It's an incredible record and he sounds amazing with this band. So let's have a listen to the song from um, from that album. This is called Taylor John. Taylor had a wife, she was married to a mirror. Take a glass, I love her by drinking in another round. Here yeah, around the kitchen table, I with cigarettes from years ago. Last night, one fell on to the floor. Hey, to the floor. Taylor used to marvel at the way the music sounded She drifted down the carpet bag, put another lamp shade on Yeah, then she was so young and pretty, holding out her hand To the last five years that living took away So as a as a producer, I I what really st sticks out to me in in this era is something that's really hard to do, which is like having a fingerstyle oriented piece of music with a band. It's always been something very challenging to make the guitar parts ring out, and that album to me is like one of the high points of recorded music with an acoustic guitar player playing and a band that responds so well to it and doesn't get in the way of of his incredible playing. So um, the next record that came out was Baker's Oil, and uh, that was 2002. But really what that was was um, essentially outtakes and extra songs from the Sky Like a Broken Clock session. Um, so it's an EP, kind of an extension album of that era. It's well worth listening to, but since it's from the same sessions, uh, I'm not going to play another song from it now. But it's really awesome, too, and it's just sort of a continuation of, of what we just heard there. So 2003 comes along and that's when we started working together in the studio and Kelly was writing a lot of new songs and wanted to make another band album. So Lee Townsend was the producer and he was also Bill Frizzell's manager, actually still is Bill Frizzell's manager. And he arranged for half the album to be done in Toronto with myself and Jesse Zubat and Scott Amendola and Andrew Downing. And half the album was gonna be done in 
I don't remember where they did it, either Portland or San Francisco, with Tucker Martin Engineering and featuring Bill Frizzell, Keith Lowe, and Scott Amendola. And uh, these sessions were all done live in a big tracking room. Our sessions were um, engineered by Sean Pierce, our great friend, um, and done over a couple of days in the outskirts of Toronto at, at a really a huge studio that's not there anymore. And uh, I remember once as we walked out to the recording area, he looked around the room and said, play it like you mean it. And that stuck with me for some reason. And anytime I'm using a set list from that day forward, I write P-I-L-Y-M-I -I at the top, which reminds me to play it like you mean it. And uh, you know, every take we did was totally different, different nuances, different feels, tempos. Sometimes the keys would change in between takes and he wouldn't tell us. And he could adapt and change so fast. And I think he liked that we were willing to follow him down those rabbit holes that he wanted to explore. So he seemed to have a, have a good time too. And when it came to picking a take, it wasn't like there was one crappy one and one good one. They were all amazing. It was like a matter of choosing between three or four wildly different performances and just committing to that one. The outtakes from that would be really cool. I don't have them, I've, I've never heard them, but they would be all like really different uh, versions of those songs. So let's have a listen to uh, something from that session. This is a song called Jericho from the session that we did in Toronto from Sky Like a Broken Clock. Oh, sorry, not from that, from uh, uh, Slingshot Professionals. Where is it here? No, oh, there it is. Jericho. <laughs> of making that record. Um, so Jesse and I toured with him after that record for a while. And then after that, he had a sort of a whole different band that he toured with. And it was like a acoustic power trio that I mentioned before with Keith Lowe and, <clears throat> and Scott Amendola. And uh, Scott actually dug up a performance that they did in France. Um, so I'm not clear on what year this would be. My guess would be 2003 or four, but I'm gonna play you uh, just a, a bit of this track that shows you he was just really going for it. And, and they had a great trio uh, playing, playing with him. And uh, this, they sort of toured like that for quite a few months, quite a few tours um, before Kelly Joe went back to playing solo. So let's listen to this really cool French radio live broadcast of Catman Bootman from around that era. Baseball cap in flannel arms Dancing with him Guitar, seeing things the 
way they are You cook it lovely on his brow Beside a wisecrack whiskey mouth Tip up the bottle and pour you just a killer track love to see that come out someday i think keith would too um so that was called Catman Bootman. boot man great song of course anyway after these band scenarios that he had uh he went back to playing solo pretty quickly and basically for the rest of his career stayed that way and right away he made a live record called tap the red cane whirlwind that my friend sean pierce recorded and mixed and it was pulled from a string of shows in i don't know 2004 or 2005 and again he's stretching out in really exciting ways but as a solo artist and uh, let's just have a little listen to a song from that and uh, this is his amazing song not so far to go from the live album tap the red cane whirlwind <laughs> Ginger and I do hair and to fit a name and Bernie parked his arms with a pack of camel lights. Long sleeves outdoors to keep the kids from crying and ginger climb the high wire just to make them Trappies float in a buttercup and parade of clowns and plastic parachutes, three red siding. Clutched arms, boat and fire dropped in bar in New York City, and not so far to go. Far to go, oh no. It's not so far to go. If I try, oh no, oh, no, oh, oh, no, 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 uh, all right, I'd like to play some more uh, videos that came in uh, for you right now, and um, let's grab one from the vault here. Um, all right, this one's from the great singer-songwriter Steve Earle. Steve Earle here. Um, after coming back to the world from a very dark place, the very first thing I discovered was Kelly Jo Phelps. And we bumped into each other kind of all over the world for a while. And um, he was um, a great slide guitar player and people tended to think of him, talk of him in those terms back then. And I couldn't help but reminding everybody that I ran into that they didn't get it. He was a singer songwriter and as good as I've ever seen. Um, see you when I get there, Maestro. 
No doubt. No doubt. There's a great thing on YouTube. If you get a chance to search it out uh, of Kelly Joe playing with um, Steve Earl and a couple other guys at the Bluebird here in Nashville. And um, it, it's got some great footage of Kelly just being like a side guy. And he's he's really good at it. It's something that he did not do very much. He did it for Towns Van Zandt, too. Um, so there you go. From the mouth of Steve Earl himself. Uh, Tony Furtado has been mentioned here already today, but he uh, he had Kelly Joe play on one of his early albums called Roll My Blues Away, which is one of the first places I heard Kelly Joe too, and it's a wonderful record. And uh, Tony's an incredible slide guitar player on, in his own right and uh, sent this in for us to see. This is Tony Furtado. Hi, I'm Tony Furtado. I'm a musician based in Portland, Oregon. Um, Kelly Joe Phelps to me was a friend, an inspiration, a brilliant genius of a musician who loved to take chances and try different things and perplex his audience. He was an enigma. <laughs> uh, I got to know his music first because I was recording an album in the mid-90s and the producer, Cookie Marenko, pulled out a tape of this amazing new um, musician, sly guitarist named Kelly Joe Phelps. and me being a new sly guitarist, I was fully steeping myself in Ry Cooter and um, <clears throat> and David Lindley and people like that. And here was this new, uh, incredible sound. Um, anyway, shortly after that, I met him at a show I was playing in Vancouver, Washington. The hosts said they knew him and would ask him to come down, and he did. And we chatted, he was warm, engaging, um, humble. He grabbed my guitar, played back to me one of my banjo tunes that he had discovered on an album I recorded with Sally Van Meter. And so, um, shocked, we be, we, uh, there was some instant camaraderie and that was really cool. We kept in touch from that point on and um, had many conversations about you know, things I hear other people say they had conversations with them about. Um, everything from music and literature and spirituality, the things that made him tick, um, and him being a proud pop, you know, talk about his daughter, Rachel. And, um, it was really, uh, really a wonderful thing to also get questions to me that he was curious about what made me tick, you know, and I, I, I got the feeling that he just wanted to know what inspired, motivated, um, moved other musicians um, uh, to do what they do and, um, and be creative. And he was very generous with what made him, um, what moved him and what guided him. And I feel I'm a better musician for having had those conversations and for having gotten to play with him and record with him on several occasions. I feel like I'm a better person <laughs> for having a lot of those conversations with him too because uh, he turned me on to some really interesting writers, poets, um, and got me thinking a lot, you know, it was really cool. And the gaps in between the times we would chat or run into each other were fairly large sometimes and that's just how he was and how it was and um it's okay you know he had his path and uh he let you in to his uh to see what what was guiding him sometimes and you know we'd go different directions and meet together anyway i i want to say that i do and will always miss uh kelly and um, uh, I'll cherish all those times that I got to hang out with him. So rest in peace, buddy. Thank you for that, Tony. Um, we have another video here from a wonderful guitar player from Oregon. And this is, I believe, Oregon, uh, uh, Mary Flower. And she sent this video in. Let's have a look. Hi, I'm Mary Flower, and uh, I have a few things to say here about Kelly Joe and the influence he had on a lot of people. Um, I want to say when he first came on the scene, um, 
mostly it was the musicians who realized how incredible it was what he was doing. Um, I personally was amazed that somebody could play a lap style guitar solo and for at least two sets a night. Um, that was kind of beyond me and I play that instrument so I understand how unusual that is. Um, I've taken some few notes here. Um, I first met him in Denver when he first came on the, on the scene and there was quite a buzz about him. Um, I went backstage, I hung out, <clears throat> I saw his old Gibson with the wide fingerboard and the white pick guard, I think. And he was really having a good time on the road. He was really, this was his first tour. And uh, then eventually I moved to Portland um, about 18 years ago. And I just missed those great days when he used to play in some little tiny little coffee house every Sunday morning. And uh, I missed that by a couple of years, but people still talk about that here in Portland, about Kelly Joe's early days. And at some point I opened for him, but I can't remember where or when that was. He lived across the Columbia River in Vancouver, Washington, um, and, but he was never home. And I had a friend who was selling a Roy Smeck guitar and I remember emailing him and he never got back to me. And um, shortly after that, I, I heard that he had stopped playing lap slide because he felt like he had taken it as far as a person could take it, which is really something. And then he switched to guitar and he took it to new places with very unique chord progressions and and finger picking. It was beautiful uh, stuff that I, uh, the likes of which I've never heard before. And his genius was obviously evident on the guitar just uh, as well as it was on the lap slide. Um, I have vague memories of being at a house in Portland where he was living later on. It seems it was a big empty house, maybe his mother's, and he was living and recording there. Um, then once I saw him at a Folk Alliance, one of those 1 a.m. showcases, and I saw him absolutely mesmerize the audience. I mean, people were just, it was, it was better than like having some sort of religious experience. It was a religious experience. People were just, you know, so taken by that smooth voice and that beautiful slide playing. It was very spiritual. Um, he was one of a kind. He was an innovator on every instrument that he touched and every song he wrote or arranged. I know he left the business behind him and I hope that that somehow helped ease his mind. I know he had demons and I'm glad they are no more. Um, we are all poor without the guiding light of Kelly Joe Phelps. Um, and thanks to Steve Dawson for putting together these memories and words of love and respect. Thank you, Mary. Um, we have a video here from a wonderful, amazing drummer, monster drummer who played with Kelly Joe. And uh, I met him actually when he was in Tony Furtado's band and played with him on the Slingshot Professionals album and also on an album of my own. And uh, let's have a listen to this video sent in from Scott Amendola. Where are you, Scotty? There you are. Hey everyone, Scott Amendola here. Uh, I played drums on Slingshot Professionals and toured with Kelly with uh, dear friend Keith Lowe on bass in the early 2000s. Uh, yeah. What a time that was, and I'm really glad our friendship extended past the touring times. Um, but we had a great time out there on the road. I mean, it wasn't always easy, um, but it was pretty special what the three of us made happen on stage um, every night. I mean, from from laughing to dancing to crying. I mean, there's never a time in my life I played music like that with anybody. Um, and I really missed it, to be honest with you, when it ended. Um, but I'm glad I got to see Kelly when he'd come to town here in Berkeley or when I was playing up in Portland. Um, and uh, he'd come and hang out or I'd go see him play, whatever. It was, you know, always special. And, uh, but 
um, we had some funny, fun and funny memories on the road. Um, one thing that I've carried with me is one of his rules. Not that I always abide by it, but I remember when we first started touring, one of the rules he had was whatever clothes you get in the van in are the clothes that you have to wear on stage. <laughs> Which, you know, I, I thought that was a great rule. Um, but, uh, uh, and I think I mostly adhered to that rule, but, um, but yeah, just, just being able to, to let, see how that music breathed every night, see how he would reinterpret things and keep us on our toes and, um, was really powerful and, uh, something that stuck with me and, uh. I don't often like to go listen to music that I've records I've played on, um, but that record and a bunch of the bootlegs that we've had, I've listened to over and over again over the years. Um, and I'm just grateful to have that. Um, yeah. I think one of the most memorable moments of my life on stage was when we played two nights at the Jazz Cafe in London. And the place was so packed that people were literally sitting on stage with us. I mean, it was like, it was like a living room, you know? And then when we finished our set and attempted to leave the stage, we couldn't because the people were just so loud and just so wanted us to play more. Um, which also reminds me of when we played in Dublin on that same tour, the dressing room was like in another building almost it felt like from the show and after we played our show and even did our encores we go up to this dressing room and you could hear this noise and the promoter came kind of running in and saying you guys have to go play some more it's going to be a riot the people are freaking out we kind of ran down and played a couple more songs but but i get it i mean the power of kelly was undeniable and i feel like keith and i were able to get into that world and it was such an honor to be a part of that and um you know i'm just sorry i'm sorry that uh, he's not with us anymore but i'm glad that he's you know in here and we can still hear his music and uh you know so um thanks for the time here and um just like kelly used to say at the end of every show you all take care of yourselves so thanks a lot Hey there, Jeff Lang here down in Melbourne, Australia, saying goodbye to my kind, thoughtful, funny, haunted yet supremely sweet friend, Kelly Jo Phelps. Man, Kelly Jo, I don't want to say goodbye. It hurts, but here we are. Man, remember, it's 1997 I met you at the Silver Dollar Room in Toronto, and we were both on a bill, and I was just knocked out by you. Um, we crossed paths a few times after that and eventually I had the real honour of opening a bunch of shows for you in the early 2000s all around the States and that's when a couple of things got really solidified for me. First of all that initial impression of your artistry was just expanded and exploded. Um, obviously incredible guitar player um, amazing facility with the lap slide guitar. Uh, incredible to me that you came up with your own voice in such a pure way. It sounded connected to traditional music but you had your own, absolutely your own voice on the instrument and that's quite a thing to have come up with after all this time in the world where slide guitar was part of popular music vocabulary and you managed to reinvent it for yourself and that was just nightly 
a revelation and an inspiration to me. Um, you were already moving beyond it, of course, at that stage. And the thing was, in your regular guitar playing, all of that same spirit was there. It had all of the same thoughtful application and exploratory, fearless approach to your music, night after night, never the same twice. Your voice and your guitar did a dance together, and it was really poetic and just wonderful to watch. We shared many wonderful experiences on the road, a lot of laughing, um, a lot of sharing of jokes, in fact trying to invent jokes so that we'd have something that the other one hadn't heard. I remember seeing you at an incredible show in Canada at um, Quebec City and not only did you do that with, I remember Tom Waits song Innocent When You Dream, you just started singing a part of that at the end of one of your songs and um, and later on I said, was that because you heard it over the PA from out the back before you went on? And you said, yeah, I heard that one and I thought, there's no way I'm going to be able to escape that tonight. And so I guess that was just part of how your artistry worked. It was part of how you just pulled on things that were happening that day and they just got funneled into what came out of you, like a an antenna picking up on things and creating this incredible art out of everything around you. Alison and I, we loved you, man. We do. I always will. Um, we wanted the best for you because how could you not? How could you not want the best for a guy like Kelly Joe Phelps? Uh, you know, I always had some kind of hope, like a lot of us did, that somewhere down the track we would reconnect again because every time we did, no matter how low on the gap, we always picked right up where we left off. And that was another wonderful side to you, man, that you could do that. The bond was always there. And I, I really appreciated it. I really appreciated you. Always will. Now, I, I just have to face that that's not going to happen again. I'm not going to catch up with Kelly Joe Phelps. And the memories will have to be enough. It's a good thing that they're so good. And the music is for all time, for all of us. You left the world a better place for you having been in it. And so I thank you for that, Kelly Joe Phelps. Love you, man. And I will always miss you. Travel well. Travel well, Kelly Joe. Hey, Steve, your uh, audio is muted. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Rachel, for the heads up. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, Kelly Joe made a huge impact in Australia and, uh, you know, has so many fans and friends from there. It's wonderful to, to see and hear from some of them. And, and Jeff is a really well-known performer there and an amazing guitar player. Um, we're going to have a look at a, a sl an, another little slideshow that came in um, just yes yesterday, actually, from a good friend of Kelly Joe's who basically like every photo of Kelly Joe that he ever saw of himself, he hated unless it was taken by Anthony St. James. <laughs> and uh, I just remember that. I remember him talking about him a lot. And I know they were great, great friends. Rachel, do you remember? Do you have any any? Uh, insight into their friendship at all. I don't really know much about him. Well, I know they were really good friends for most of my entire life. And um, it's been a long time since I've seen Anthony, um, but he um, came to the apartment when we lived in the pink apartment building downtown Vancouver. And um, I know my dad just talked about him all the time. And of course, Anthony did, um, a lot of his photos, photos for albums. And um, I know that they were just very close and shared a lot of experiences together. Yes, indeed. Well, I'd like to thank Anthony for putting this uh, little slideshow together where he sort of talks about their relationship a bit and talks through some of these photos. So let's have a look at, at this um, slideshow from Anthony St. James. Hi, my name is Anthony St. James and Kelly Joe and I were, were close friends and he was a chosen brother to me. 
Um, the first thing I'd like to do is send my condolences to his family and friends. I pulled out some, some photos to share with you, so what I think I'll do is say a little something about Kelly Joe. I'll show you some photos while I share a few words. I've known Kelly Joe since 1997. Uh, Ryko Disc sent me some music for an upcoming photo session. Uh, he was about to come out with Roll Away the Stone, and um, I remember sitting uh, in my Seattle apartment and putting the CD into the tray and pressing the play button. And from those very first notes, I was hooked. I really enjoyed um, being asked to go spend time with Kelly Joe on the road. You know, being on the road with a band is one thing, but when it's a solo artist, you got to make sure that the people that are on the road with you don't uh, don't ruffle your feathers. Kelly Joe and I talked about a lot of things. Um, one of the things was that 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 this day would would eventually come and if he went first i would i would show some photos um maybe say a few words so this is a, a hell of a lot sooner than i ever thought it would happen but uh, here i am doing just that um, a lot of these were taken just for just for fun um this is that 19 1930s look this is backstage. This is somewhere in Michigan. This is a session that wound up uh, being on the cover of Tune Smith Retrofit. Just he and I. Lots of hanging out in hotels, back streets. some literature writing while he stayed at the Chelsea Hotel. As a matter of fact, I think this is him taking a break from writing. And then this night shot later on in the day. I know that he liked this photo. Uh, this is the, uh, the secret agent, Ivan. This is on the Jersey coast. We had a little inside joke. Uh, he would call me Frankie, <laughs> and I would call him Ivan. So from Frankie to Ivan, watch out for that quicksand and no requests. I'm going to miss you. Peace, brother. Man, such great photos. Thanks so much, Anthony, for sending that in. And, you know, as somebody involved in Kelly Joe's career, I recognize so many of those images from various places and gigs and and record covers and whatnot and uh yeah i i remember him very well talking about anthony so appreciate that um let's go back to his discography for a minute and uh talk about the final batch of albums that make up the the last um phase of his career starting with tunesmith retrofit that anthony just mentioned in 2006 and um this was a couple years after I'd been playing in his band. And when we were playing with him, he was really exploring. There was no set lists. He wouldn't tell us what the next song was gonna be. He'd just start playing. It was wild. Our car rides were particularly crazed, high-speed adventures through America. Talking about music, telling crazy jokes. And I remember him obsessing over John Fahey's America album, Ornette Coleman, John Coltrane, and Chris Whitley. 
and we would blast those artists all day in the car and arrive at the gig fueled with e ringing ears and all that music to drive us through the night's show. After those tours, though, I didn't hear from him for a bit, and that's kind of how he rolled. But as he always seemed to do with me, I, I would get this call out of the blue, and that's what happened. And he said he'd like me to produce a record for him. Uh, we talked about a lot of the songs that he'd been writing recently and what he wanted to do, and we spent four days in a studio in Vancouver, Canada, making Toonsmith Retrofit, which is another beauty of a record. And again, he was really searching in his writing, and had, he'd sort of dialed down the improvisation so he could focus on songcraft. And that was, I think, reflected in the title of the, of the record. But this is a little, uh, I'd like to just play a bit of a, a song from that record for you. And uh, this is a little more on the jammy side, I guess, but it's still a brilliant song. And I remember him loving to play this song and getting a real kick out of it. So uh, I'm gonna play a bit of a song from Toonsmith Retrofit for you. This is called Big Shaky. Ten steps weaving through the bottom of the floor Taking a lift, broken the door Twelve step, I don't wanna think like that I will change my code Hold down my head and pray Holler, oh no, don't no, let it fade Clear eyes and clean hands Get a good man Side two foot slide, spit the joy from the doors green and find an old fence. I can lean against it. Yeah, that's Toonsmith Retrofit. He was really like his wordplay was getting really incredible. I remember going through, he, he showed up at the session with a big book full of like really neatly typed lyrics that he'd sent me a couple of weeks before and I'd poured through them and I still have it. There's like 30, 30 songs that he'd written and uh, all the lyrics to them. And I just remember that being a real, you know, something that he was really focused on at that point. So that gets us to the, <clears throat> the next album, Western Bell, which is a bit complicated. It's an album that confused a lot of people <laughs> and I think made people think that he was losing his marbles a bit. And it's called Western Bell. And believe me, he was not losing his marbles. He was fully aware of what he was doing. And this album for him was a really important artistic expression. Um, Rachel, do you remember anything about this record? And I do know that he was back recording at home for this. And maybe you have a memory about that happening. Yes. Um, well, when he was recording, this was actually right when I had gone to college. So I wasn't at home with him while he was recording, but I know exactly what was going on in his life at that time. And I agree with what you said. I think it confused a lot of people. And I think it just kind of went over people's heads and it seemed like something a bit too experimental. Um, but for me, listening to it, I think it's the most personal album he ever made, which is interesting because there aren't any lyrics and it is so different from any of his other music. But the songs on that album sound a lot more like just hanging out at home and my dad's playing the guitar. Um, and he really said so much in that album through those songs and he put the deepest parts of himself into that album. And so much so that it's the only, aside from a few songs, it's the only album that really just makes me weak because I, I hear so much and I see so much when I listen to it. So I just, it's, I think a very underappreciated album. And if you're wanting to know more about who he was, that album definitely says a lot. I agree. He sent it to me and I was knocked out. You know, I loved weird music and it was weird. And I, mm -hmm. I, 
I, I got it I right away. Like I understood what he was doing. You know, I, I knew that he was really into John Fahey and this album sort of had, you know, flavors of, of Fahey, but it actually went a little Absolutely. further even. Um, so interestingly, uh, one of the other emails that, that Kelly Joe sent Gregory Allen Isakoff addresses this a little bit. And I didn't read it before because it sort of pertained to this album. So I'd just like to read it read it to you now. So this is Kelly Joe sending an email to Gregory, I, Gregory Allen Isakoff in reference to his new record, Western Bell. It says, <clears throat> here's a question we both hate coming from other people, but I'll try it on anyway. Want to trade CDs? <laughs> I've got a new one out too that I'd like you to have. A crazy but beautiful instrumental thing, full of improvisation and reaction, and not one whit of a care toward industry. People seem to either really dig it or absolutely hate it, which makes me wonder that I might be on to something good. It also might be the last record I ever make. The one problem it creates is what to do with it in performance. Oh well, it came from the deepest part of me, the most honest part, and in that it stands. Peace to you, Kelly Joe. And I think that really says it all. And uh, let's just have a listen to a song or a snippet from <clears throat> that album. And you know, if it's an album that you skipped over, maybe go back and give it another spin. It's a wild ride, I promise. Uh, so this is from Western Bell and uh, this is called Hometown with Melody. One of the things that I love about that record too is is that it like in the midst of completely chaotic improvisations keeps coming back to these like really singable simple little melodies not every song is like that but that one certainly is it has that theme that just keeps keeps coming back um so after Western Bell Kelly Joe made a cool record with Corinne Corinne West called Magnetic Magnetic Skyline and they toured all over the states and the UK as a duo um we're not talking about it here much because it was it was not a really a solo Kelly Joe Phelps record, but you may know that one already and you can go check it out. Um, but that gets us to his last studio album, which was uh, 2012's Brother Sinner and the Whale. 